Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. David Canton, and I'm the director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Florida. And welcome to our Critical Race Theory, a virtual discussion. Initially, I, when we thought about this, we we're going to have it live at Rights Union. But fortunately for, tech, fortunately for us, technology will allow us to have this great discussion for the next 60 minutes or so. But before we begin, I'd like to, uh, thanks to uh, say thanks to our co-sponsors, the African American Studies Program, the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, the Black Faculty Recruitment and Retention Racial Just Justice Grant Committee, the Dr. Patricia Hilliard Nunn Sankofa Institute, and the Research Education and Transformation Furthering Investigation of the University of Florida and its legacies to indigenous removal and slavery, another racial uh, justice grant organization. So we all decided, let's talk about critical race theory, CRT. Gained a lot of traction this summer uh, with all different types of definitions, interpretations, meanings, misinformation. And we're, to have, we're here to have that discussion to make sure people really understand the debate. So when you have a debate, you really have a, bit, a deeper understanding of what CRT is. So, the, so what I'll do the next is introduce our moderator, Mr. Mike Foley. Mike Foley is the master lecturer, Hugh Cunningham Professor in Journalism Excellence. He's a veteran newspaper editor and executive now on the faculty of the College of Journalism and Communications at the University of Florida in Gainesville. After nearly 30 years with the Times Publishing Company, which publishes the Tampa Bay Times, formerly the St. Petersburg Times, the largest daily newspaper of Florida, he joined the faculty in August 2003 as a master lecturer in the journalism department. Foley's classes focuses on news, reporting, and writing. At the Times, he served as an executive editor, managing editor, metropolitan editor, and city editor. Now there's much more to read in his bio, but I'm gonna stop there. And then I'm allow Mike to introduce our discussants, our panelists, and from there, we'll start this discussion. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mike, take it away. Thank you, David. Uh, a very impressive panel, I must say. I'm gonna start with Michelle uh, S. Jacobs. J Jacobs teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, international criminal law, critical race theory, being uh, in a seminar, criminal law in the virtual context, which examined the ways technological development creates interesting intersections between traditional civil law and criminal law. Her students blog about crime and technology. Before taking on the teaching role, jo Jacobs was an experienced trial attorney. She represented union workers in uh, District Council 37, New York's second largest union, then went on to present, represent plaintiffs in federal civil rights litigation under the Fair Housing Act. After transitioning her practice to criminal defense, she represented defendants in federal cases in the Southern District of New York and in the state courts of New York and New Jersey. Michelle. Jacobs. Uh, our other uh, panelist, Dr. Richard Connolly. Con Connolly is a professor of political science and director of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program at UF, where he has taught since 1998. His teaching and research focus on American politics, the presidency, and most recently, Native American studies. His recent book, Donald Trump and the American, and American Populism, was published by Edinburgh University Press in 2020. He is currently researching a book based on archival and field research that investigates the way in which traditional institutions, Congress, the presidency, and the Supreme Court have interacted since 1949 to shape incongruencies in policymaking towards Native Americans, including economic and social development, education, and the protection of sacred sites on and off reservation lands. He currently serves as American Political Field Chair in the Department of Political Science and has been a member of the college's Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee since 2018. A, a, a terrific, terrific, knowledgeable panel, and I'm certain we will have a wonderful discussion. I was telling uh, telling the panel earlier today that we know that the critical race theory is an important uh, subject because it was parodied on Saturday Night Live two weeks ago. They were doing a, a takeoff on a contentious, a contentious school board meeting when somebody fought her way to the microphone and said, I want to talk about critical race theory. And then she said, well, what? What is it? So I think that will be my first question. And we'll start with Michelle, who teaches a course in this. What is critical race theory? Your mic is not. Good laugh when I'm done with that. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just apologize to everybody for a few minutes because um, 
people don't really know what critical race theory is, so I'm going to take my time, uh, about eight to 10 minutes, and explain to you what it is so that you can uh, formulate good questions and be knowledgeable uh, in your future conversations. And I promise after that, I'll be shorter. But <laughs> right now, we want to get the nuts and bolts of the meaning down, all right? So critical race theory is one of five modern jurisprudential approaches to analyzing law. Uh, for those of us who are not philosophers, jurisprudence can be a big word that sounds a little scary, but it's really just the philosophy of law. And throughout history, legal scholars, academics, and general philosophers have engaged in debates about how you should interpret law and how it should be applied. All philosophies, no matter where they come from or who's doing it that are directed to law, have a particular focal point that they use to help explain how law developed or how it should be applied. And critical race theory is no different. In the old days when it was just men uh, in law, they used, uh, as some of you may have heard of this, there was an idea that uh, law was either legitimate because the, the entities that created law had the power to make it and enforce it. And, th and they uh, argued with people who believed that there was something called natural law that law was above man, that it was actually derived from God. And as to those principles of law, man could not uh, challenge or change because they actually came from a high authority. So there's been no time in history where we didn't have differing viewpoints on how we should interpret law. Now, in the 70s, in the late 70s, uh, law, like most other professions, were forced to include people beyond the traditional white male lawyer. And as a result of that, new ways of thinking were introduced into law. And so we had um, the first three critical theorists were critical legal studies, which essentially was created by, uh, I wanna say left-leaning white men who basically challenged how we think about law and asked us to think about it through the lens of power and economic, um, uh, economic power, right? Who has the power and who has the money to be able to say what law should be, how it should be applied, and who's going to be impacted by it. Most of those guys eventually got tenure and they became much more conservative. Um, the second theory that followed that was, of course, one that you're all well familiar with, which was feminist legal theory. And of course, the lens that feminist legal theory used was the lens of gender. How were women impacted by the development of law, particularly when women's positions weren't included within the formation of law and the consequences of applying law to women weren't considered. So feminist legal theory asked us to think about those things from the perspective of women. Now, of course, critical race theory came next and it uses the lens of race to look at how law was developed, interpreted and applied. We call those theories critical because they challenge the status quo understanding of how law is thought about. Now, since then, we've had two additional critical theories, uh, LAT crit, which looks at the issue of language and ethnicity and how that is impacted uh, by law. And of course, queer law, which looks at the issue of uh, the impact of gender identity on the formation and application of law. Critical race theory challenges the assertion that developed after civil rights legislation was passed, that law is colorblind, quote unquote. The phrase colorblind comes from a dissenting opinion that Justice Harlan wrote in the seminal case, Plessy versus Ferguson, where the Supreme Court upheld segregation in the United States based on race. Plessy wrote a dissenting opinion saying the majority is wrong. And he's traditionally hailed as somebody who was heroic <laughs> in going against the separate but equal line of thought. Unfortunately, we don't teach Plessy's whole, we don't teach Fergus, um, Harlan's whole opinion in con law. We just teach the part where he becomes a hero. So it's always surprising for law students to know that Harlan was a dyed in the wool racist. <laughs> right after the part when he talks about colorblind, he lays out some blasphemous statement about Chinese Americans. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, we don't read Harlan in the full context of his uh, opinion. So we're stuck with that colorblind language, which, of course, is what the majority wants because it undercuts the ability to argue that race has something to do with the development and application of law. So the critical race theorists challenge this notion that law is colorblind. 
And it, it's a big challenge because even in law school today, we teach that law is colorblind. Well, some people teach it. I don't teach that because I'm a critical race theorist and I know that law has not been colorblind and it is not colorblind now. But nonetheless, that idea came about after the civil rights era had passed. CRT contradicts that. As CRT scholars, we look at all American law and we go back to the colonial era before we became this entity called the United States. And we look to see how was race or color expressly used in the law to exclude Africans from the protection of law and then to deny rights to African-Americans, Mexicans, indigenous people, and Asians, even though these were the uh, rights that were enjoyed by uh, whites within the society. When we use color or race to explicitly exclude, we call that de jure exclusion, D-E-J-U-R-E, -E, a Latin word, which means by law. And those denial of constitutional rights are based on the de jure exclusion. So law allowed the exclusion. De jure exclusion continued past the end of the Civil War, right? So this is another myth that American students have that at the end of the Civil War, everything was oh, good and friendly and racism ended. Well, that's not true because we know that it existed right up, de jure exclusion existed right up to the late 1960s. So in addition to studying the history of the development of law, CRT scholars also look at the institutions that were built to regulate society during the 300 plus years of de jure exclusion, right? So we want to know how were those institutions established and impacted by the fact that law allowed exclusions based and the denial of constitutional protections based on race or color. Today, racism is what we call de facto, right? Meaning that the law no longer explicitly uses race to exclude or to deny constitutional rights. But the racism still exists. We call it de facto. It's no longer required by law, but it exists because the institutions that were built when race and color were allowed explicitly to exclude still exist. They were never dismantled or change in the few short years that we've had since the word race was excised from the language of law. So even though we've eliminated race and color as a basis for exclusion, the practices and the cultural beliefs remain firmly in place today and are now not available to be challenged. So it's the role of the critical race theory scholars to draw the thread or connect the dots if you want between the racial injustice and the exclusion of rights that happened during the 300 plus years of de jure exclusion and the systems of discrimination that still exist today. That's our job to build that up. Now, how do we do that? We don't make up our source material, right? <laughs> Unlike other popular people today, we're scholars. We actually have to read real sources. So we study the actual laws that were enacted in the colonies. We study the development of the language chosen for the constitution and follow the debates of the framers around what should and should not have been included in the constitutional language. We study Supreme Court opinions, congressional legislation, state legislation and state constitutions. We study the records of the US Army and other military units. We look at treaties and covenants between Native Americans, Chinese, Japanese, Mexicans. We study administrative decisions. In other words, we study the full range of American legal history, all of it, not just the shiny parts that people like to speak about. So I know that Professor Conley is, uh, writes about presidents and indigenous people. And so I'm throwing the question out to him, would you be able to write about Thomas Jefferson, for example, without talking about the debates he was involved in, in the formation of the, our country, the United States, or the, the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that came out of it. Would, would that be a full telling of the history of Thomas Jefferson if we didn't discuss that? 
Or should we just say, you know, he went to France a couple of times <laughs> and he was really smart and he had a nice big house and he loved to plant stuff. <laughs> you know, that's not a full telling of the history of Thomas Jefferson. And I, I, I would love to hear your response to that. So that we, we don't do that little shiny story. We look at the whole picture so that we can help our legal institutions understand how they were developed, why they function the way they do, and where the where the either errors in decision making or the damage that law is doing happen so that we can correct it in the future. That's what critical race theory is. It's a philosophy of law. Thank you. I finally uh, finally truly understand it a lot better. Richard, she put a question to you. Can you uh, can you expound, please? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks to Dr. Canton, uh, to you, Mike, and to, to Professor Jacobs for inviting me. Um, getting a message, my internet connection is unstable. I'm sorry, I'm out in the country, so I hope it reestablishes itself. Um, you know, I am not a scholar of African American history. Uh, I teach our introductory class on occasion in American politics mostly to journalism students and some small segment of political science. And um, everything that uh, Professor Jacobs mentioned about the, you know, this difference between de jure and de facto um, segregation, thing that I, I like to emphasize, and I do like to go back to history because you can't understand the contemporary situation unless you understand that. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm delighted by her explanation. Um, I think that debunks some of the uh, sort of debates that are going on in school boards and everything where people reduce these complexities down to, you know, well, you're just teaching everybody, you know, you know, people of different races, ethnicities, whatever it is, you know, to dislike each other. Uh, I think, you know, someone just wrote in the chat there, I thought, you know, Professor Jacobs did an excellent job. And I'm here to educate myself as well. I can certainly see how critical race theory applies to this kind of a new field for me. I've been in the academy for 25 years and I've kind of gone in a different direction in Native American studies, having grown up in the Southwest and liaised with many, many tribes. Um, I, you know, I think, I, think, I think you're absolutely correct, Professor Jacobs. You, you think of, of Thomas Jefferson, <clears throat> Let me say this. I had a conversation, um, you know, Indigenous Peoples Day was, was a week ago, Monday, and I had some folks from Louisiana uh, come in from the United Homa Nation, uh, state recognized, but not federally recognized tribe. One of my friends who used to be uh, the uh, governor's director of Indian Affairs said, what do you make when, when, when you see the word savage in the, in, in, in the declaration or, or the constitution? And we had a long discussion of this, and, and it goes back to the French, uh, les sauvages. And she doesn't speak French, I do. And I said, well, you know, that term kind of means for the French speaker, those people who are not Christian. In other words, they were heathens, right? Um, and, and Thomas Jefferson, I think, borrowed that. He was, he was a French speaker. We all know he lived in France, et cetera. Um, you know, what's interesting to me, and, and I go through this in my Native American politics course, is that many elements of our own thinking about our constitution, in, you know, in 1787, uh, you know, when, when Jefferson was holed up in Philadelphia that hot summer, um, came from, in fact, the Iroquois Confederation. When we think about our own Senate, you know, the fact that the, quote, five civilized tribes uh, the Seneca and, 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 and so forth, um, in fact, had an equal place at the table. Well, that, that influenced Madison, Jefferson, other, other architects of the Constitution in terms of how we would structure our Senate. And of course, the House was based on population, the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan, the Greek compromise, all of this. Um, but clearly, you know, the fact that, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are, are endowed by their creator didn't apply to certain peoples. Right? African-Americans at that point had been, you know, forcibly taken to this new world, as well as the indigenous populations 
considered uh, at same caliber. Um, and I think that that's the stain on our institution. Um, I know many students, many, many others ha have a difficulty kind of looking at that and realizing it, but it explains a lot. I think when we look at, at, at the history of African Americans and what they have had to overcome and still continue to fight for, and certainly in my field uh, with indigenous Americans, with, you know, where, where poverty is, is still very rampant, social services are often non-existent. Some places don't even have, you know, running water or heat. Uh, which is pretty tough on the Great Plains. So, you know, I guess my response is that, you know, I think for me, part of it is that we have to go back to this like 18th century thinking. You know, we look at the that that lovely language, the preamble, the constitution, the declaration, but but peoples were excluded uh, from that. And and I think there's a lot that can be said for. Um, you know, how you've explained critical race theory helps me to understand how this is applicable in, in multiple cases, whether it's a Chinese or, or Hispanics, you know, the, the railways out west where I grew up, all these sorts of things. Um, I think that's very helpful that, that, that there was a limited sort of viewpoint of, you know, <clears throat> the creator endowed us with these inalienable rights, but they only applied to certain people. And then you look at the evolution of how we have tried to be more inclusive, and it's obviously been a, a bumpy path. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I really appreciate your explanation. It helps educate me, uh, you know, as a scholar, and and uh, you know, I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's so important too because you mentioned the Iroquois Confederacy, which they don't refer to themselves as that, but I can't pronounce the. The, the indigenous <laughs> name that they use because I didn't practice that this morning. <laughs> don't, don't worry, believe me, I, you know, try learning Navajo like I did. I've got myself in all kinds of trouble with that. You know, yeah. Arizona, so. Just think about uh, recently Rick Santorum uh, made a public statement that there was nothing here before white people built America. And just think how differently children would understand our history if they knew that actually the Iroquois Confederacy a group of indigenous people contributed ideas to the founders, which they loved and adopted and built into our uh, founding documents. You know, that puts a completely different spin on the idea that there was nothing here but savages before white people came, you see? Um, so, so in critical race theory, we're looking at the whole thing, right? We're looking at not just what you're telling us, but what actually happened, the history of what happened. Because as, as I said to you guys uh, in our pre-talk, history means it already happened, <laughs> right? It's an event that finished, people documented it and they wrote about it and you can't go back and change it because it's done. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to the history of the development of law so that people understand how did law get to the place where it is now and what can we do about it? All right, thank you very much both of you for your enlightening answers. Uh, I have another question, but first I want to make sure that everybody knows, all the audience members, that if you have a question, you're going to get a chance to ask that at the end. We're going to have a special Q&A session at the end. So save up your good questions. I know you've got the experts here, so put them on the spot if you want to. I think they're willing, more than willing. All right, then. I, I understand more about it than I ever have before. Uh, and now I think I, I can probably help answer this question myself, but why the big deal? Why is this so controversial? Why are people banning it from classrooms? What, what, what's behind all that? Okay, so, well, oh, who's going? Richard, you wanna go? Go ahead, Michelle. You're a top, there you go. Okay, um, I wasn't sure who was, who was going there first. Um, so, one of the things you have to understand about law in the United States is that different political parties have their um, lobbyists. Uh, you may be familiar with that word. A lobbyist is someone who goes to Congress and tries to convince uh, members of Congress to vote for different pieces of legislation. Um, and there are certain lobbyists who represent political uh, action groups or think tanks that always are proposing fairly conservative 
uh, pieces of legislation. Your own Florida stand your ground law, which creates great havoc in the criminal justice system, is an example of a piece of legislation that a think tank wanted and hired lobbyists to go around the country and get various different states to endorse it. So what is happening with a few think tanks now is that, um, and I'll just mention two of them, uh, the Charles Koch Foundation and the Manhattan Institute, although there are others as well, have gotten together and decided that they're going to make this attack on critical race theory. Now in a second, I'll tell you uh, what they're really attacking, but this is the thing they come out in front with uh, critical race theory. And they've introduced the idea that critical race theory, the philosophy of law, <laughs> is being taught in grades K through 12, and that somehow or another, this is making white children hate themselves, right? This is a language that you see in the populist uh, media discussion. So let's just clean that up first. Critical race theory has never been taught K through 12 because it's the philosophy of law. You have to be in law school to, to get it. Um, and even the law students sometimes don't get it at the second and third year because it's a complicated concept. And sometimes you see upper level college classes where uh, the faculty have students who may be a little bit advanced and they will try to explore some of the critical race theory issues. But the course itself is a 14 week course and it's taught in law school. All right, so why are they trying to get these parents at these school boards to think that critical race theory is taught in K through 12? The answer is not complicated at all. It's to stoke fear in that portion of the white population that belie believes in something called replacement theory. Right? So for them, it's a dog whistle, right? The politicians who use the phrase critical race theory, as you can see from TV, don't even know what it is themselves. If you ask them to define it, they cannot because they don't know what it is. They're just going based on the, uh, the lobbyist representation of the legislation that they want to get. But the people who are in that camp recognize a dog whistle when they hear it. And so they stoke up that fear in order to get parents to react the way, the, the insane way <laughs> that we've been seeing them react on the various different news broadcasts. Now, why is that? Why now are we getting that kind of reaction? As I said, critical race theory developed in the late 70s. Derek Bell first started putting those ideas out in 1978. And there have been a whole, I wasn't even in law school then, right? And there have been a whole, and I've been a lawyer for a really, really long time. And there have been a whole host of scholars who have uh, discussed critical race theory, written about it and published on it in the 40 years since then. So why is it a problem now? It's a problem now because of the social justice movement that has happened since the executions of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. For the first time since 1960s, we have a mass movement that is multiracial, cuts across class, that is fighting for the end of oppression of black and brown people in the United States. And guess what? They're having some success with that. It's not publicized much in the media, but there have been pockets of success throughout the country focusing around social justice and particularly police reform. So in order to halt that process, we've got to create some dynamic that threatens the people who are engaged in the process and causes the people who would be likely to support them to be afraid to support them, right? And that's what's happening with this so-called attack on critical race theory, because they're, they're not actually attacking the philosophy of law class, right? They're not coming to the law schools and attacking the, the law professors and the lawyers. They're going, we're attacking K through 12. But let me tell you something. If you have a 12 year old who's learning critical race theory, you should call Guinness Book of Records because that 12 year old is a second year law student. So you've got a genius on your hands, right? You should be proud of that because the fact of the matter is no 12 year old is learning critical race theory. But what is happening is that their teachers are talking about race issues in class, right? So critical race theory is being intentionally conflated with any discussion 
of race, equality, inclusion, diversity, whatever the little popular words are you like to use, right? At the bottom of the nugget is the attempt to halt the discussion of anti-Blackness, right? Now, you may think, okay, well, that's just gonna impact black and brown people. So, you know, we as white people don't have to worry about that. I'm using the royal we, cause obviously I'm not white. <laughs> <laughs> we as white people don't have to worry about that, but just pay attention to your news last week. In Texas, one of the states that has the uh, most severe anti-race legislation, a school official told teachers, if you have a book in your room about the Holocaust, you have to teach the competing side. Well, what is the competing side of the Holocaust? World War II happened, right? It's over, it's done. Six million Jews were executed, killed, genocide committed in World War II. There is no competing side to that. We can argue why certain historical facts happened, but the fact that they happened is not open for debate because the history is done, it's finished. So that happened in Texas. In York, Pennsylvania, you had the school board ban every single book that discussed Black people <laughs> in their school library. And I was looking at the list uh, earlier today. They also banned the books that talked about fried dough bread that Native American people eat. They, they banned the books, uh, there was a book called um, I'm not your perfect Mexican girl. They banned that. They banned uh, Don Donald Cherry, that's, that's his name. The animator Donald Cherry's story about helping his uh, little black girl comb her hair. They banned that. As a teaching resource, they banned the PBS documentary <laughs> on African-Americans, a six part series that runs on PBS during Black History Month, that got banned, right? So. You know, you have a state, Tennessee, who wants to put cameras on teachers so that they can be recorded when they're teaching to see if they say anything about race. We can't get cameras on police officers that are shooting people down in the street, but you want to put a camera on a teacher who is talking about race. You see, it's, it's, it's insane, right? And I, I found a cartoon today I'm going to share with you. Um, it's just short, but I want you to read the text on it because this really explains it perfectly. So I hope you can see that. But for the folks who might have some um, uh, visibility issues, it's a picture of one of the girls who's integrating uh, Little Rock Public School in 1957. It's her picture and it's a crowd of white adults behind her, jeering at her and trying to prevent her from entering school. And the caption on the picture says, so the folks who tried to prevent a black girl from going to school in 1957 are opposed to their grandchildren learning about how they tried to prevent a black girl from going to school in 1967. And this is the crux of it exactly, right? In our school systems today, some whites have decided that black and brown children should only know their history as enslaved people but they should not know how they contributed to the building of this great country that we live in uh, because that gives them some power. And then two weeks ago in Connecticut, not a Southern state, a coordinator of the school campaign, school board campaigns said in a virtual meeting, if we teach black and brown kids that they are part of American history, that's gonna make the white kids feel bad. How could that possibly be so? It could be so if you believe in replacement theory, right? Which even before critical race theory, many of you knew about replacement theory. This is a conservative Christian uh, theory. It started out saying that Jews were replacing Christians and that presented a danger to white Christian society. Now that's been co-opt to Brown and black people are replacing white people and that's a danger to white society. That is what we call a zero sum game analysis. So that if we're talking about everyone being included, if I include you, therefore I must be excluded, right? 
that there's no room at the table for your view, for my view, for the Asian view, for the Latino view. And this is an error in thinking. It's the thinking of an oppressor group because you have excluded others. If others get power, they will exclude you. But the community of color doesn't think that way because they're not an oppressor group, right? They're the group that's been oppressed. So they're thinking, well, if the table's not big enough for all of us, let's get a bigger table so that everyone's views can be heard. Not let's reduce the table and kick some people off of it. That's an oppressor view. We're talking about inclusion of all of the voices in the American spectrum so that we can all continue to contribute to the greatness of the nation. So that's what the opposition is about now. They want to prevent that from happening, to maintain the zero sum game and to press out the replacement theory, which if you watch Fox News, I know that's very popular in Florida, Tucker Carlson, is that right? Tucker Carlson has many times on Fox News raised the replacement theory. So once again, it's not the critical race scholars who are making that up. We're just commenting and reflecting on what is happening in society. Richard, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, you know, I spent a week ago Sunday making fry bread with my Native American friend from the United Homo Nation in Louisiana. So I hope UF doesn't ban uh, fry bread for our next event, which we're trying to talk about murdered and missing indigenous women. Um, I hope some of you will attend. I'll send it out, you know, the notice widely and broadly. It's a huge issue. Most of you know about Gabby Petito. Uh, what we don't know are the, the thousands of murdered and mis missing indigenous women. Our statistics are very, very rare. Uh, we believe what's reported, you know, three out of every five uh, indigenous women are subject to some kind of sexual assault in their life, if not repeatedly. And I, I, I hope that our program in, in American Indian and indigenous studies can shed some light on that. We're working on getting some people down for the 17th of November, hopefully. But, um, you know, I, I, I think from a political science standpoint, you know, what I would add to Professor Jacobs very eloquent discussion of this is that my concern is that in these school board meetings, but, but, but let's take that out of it as a university community, as people who live amongst each other, we, we tend to boil things down to the lowest common denominator. We don't look at the complexity of our history when it comes to race, when it comes to uh, ethnicity, uh, the, the legal implications, the Supreme Court decisions, and you know, all of that, that, that I'm, I'm you know, somewhat well-versed in, I guess, as a political scientist. But what worries me the most is that we talk past each other. And, and this is, it's not just a question of race. It's, you, you, can, you, can, you can put in that little black box, you know, taxes, spending, whatever it is. I mean, people people don't, we, we, we lack social capital. And what I mean by that is, is, is the building of trust between people. And it's all that much more important. Um, you know, I, I'll share this. I mean, I have, I have a very good friend in Texas. Actually, he's leaving there. He's African-American. We've known each other for 25 years. And he says, Rich, you just don't get it as a white person because half my family came from Texas. And I, I kind of look at it as, you know, Shangri-La or something like, you know, get to wear my cowboy boots and hat. Nobody, you know, looks at me weird like they would in Florida or elsewhere. He said, you know, as a black person, he said, you know, you, you got to understand. I said, what? He said, well, I wanted to go take my boat on or my, my canoe down the boat lawn landing. And I said, well, why do you have to go check it out first? And he said, because you don't know how the local authorities are going to react or, or the, the folks around there. And, I, and I'm like, I've never had that experience. And he said, well, you've never experienced driving while black either. And I said, what does that mean? And, you know, what, what's good for me, you know, as a white Irish guy, you know, 
uh, you know, talking to my friend down in Texas and, and others, you know, other friends I have here on campus is that, you know, they're, they're able to educate me about the experience. You know, I, you know, and, and my friend and I were, were talking a, a couple of years ago, I, I had one experience that most people probably don't have that might be analogous to something that that uh, African Americans do. I was on an Indian reservation out in Arizona where, where I hail from. And uh, I was driving a fancy car that the rental agency in Las Vegas had given me. And I went to meet the tribal chairman and I got pulled over uh, by a tribal cop. And, and uh, you know, I was in this big Ford, whatever the heck it was. And it certainly didn't resemble the res cars out there, you know, in the Wallapai reservation. The guy said, you know why I stopped you? And I said, I have no idea, sir. He said, you ran that stop sign. And I said, no, I was, I was parked there for like five minutes trying to get a, you know, signal out here in the middle of the desert. He said, no, you ran that stop sign. And, and he wrote me up a ticket. And, uh, you know, I, I, I acknowledged that. I took it and I ended up, you know, paying 50 bucks for it. But I, I felt something, you know, my friend informed me of this, you know, it's like I felt something that, that I think a lot of African Americans do. It's like, you know, it was like, it was like something that was painted on that rental vehicle said, hey, white guy, stop him, you know, give him a ticket. And, and you know, I, I've shared a lot of this with, with some friends and certainly with, with my, my, my good friend down in Texas. And, and so most of us as, as, as non-native, non you know, African American, whatever, you know, we have not had those kinds of experiences. And so what, what I hope is that, you know, we all talk to each other, build the social capital. You know, we may not always agree on things, but understanding the, the experiences. And I think for me as a white person, I've not had a lot of the same kind of experiences as a lot of other people of color. And, and listening to that, I think it's, it's really critical and build that trust so that when we get to school board meetings and we get to, you know, you know other, other kinds of situation, politics, that, 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 that we establish is that, you know, someone who, who is, is looking at critical race theory is against me as an individual. I mean, I can't control my, you know, my heritage any, any more than anyone else can but to understand that historical and contemporary experience so that we can, you know, form that perfect, that more perfect union. I think that's what, you know, my, my goal is that, um, you know, we go back to that, that very foundation. Maybe it may, meant something different back in 1787. We've got to talk to one another, not scream at each other, and, and be sensitive to, you know, the experiences of, quote, the other, uh, which has been very different from people, you know, like, like myself. So, uh, again, I, I appreciate what Professor Jacobs has to say. It, 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 it makes a lot of sense. I just hope we can begin to build the relationships. And, it, you know, I, I, from my perspective, I think it starts at the grassroots. It starts with the students who don't, you know, they don't agree with each other. One of, the, one of my biggest pleasures a few years ago was watching two students, one was African-American, one was, was not, and they disagreed on everything in my presidency class. And I watched those two walk out of my class. They went over to Starbucks. I was headed over to the library in Smathers and those two bought each other coffees and they sat down. When I left that, that, that you know, I was down in the basement of course as an academic. I walked out of there about an hour, hour and a half later, and those two were still talking and having a great discussion. And that's what I hope, is that, that we have these kinds of discussions that are frank, they're difficult, but, but they need to be had, and they need to be had in a, in a respectful way rather than people shouting down school boards or you know all of this other kind of stuff that's going on. So anyway, that's, that's my two cents. I don't know if that's helpful. It all helps, Richard, it all helps. Uh, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the difference between uh, anecdotes, anecdotal uh, stories, personal stories, and the structural inequality that in, in, in the world, in, in the United States, certainly, but in the, in the world. Uh, how do you view that in terms of CRT? That's a great question. Uh, because for us in law, anecdotal doesn't count, right? Lawyers don't 
funny enough, because we tell stories, that's how we win our cases, right? But we don't believe in uh, someone coming forward and verbally giving their experience. Um, we call that anecdotal. And in the evidentiary rules, it's not worth much. We want to have hard facts, hard evidence of whatever is going. But here's the dilemma. Nobody wants to study the hard facts about what's going on in the communities of color, right? Nobody wants to fund that research. No grad students besides the black and brown grad students want to do that research. And if they want to do that research, will they have a faculty supervisor who's willing to credit them with doing that research and give them the full respect that any other kind of research would need? Yes, you see? So this is how, this is how the system, systemic problems develop. I think that one of the, uh, if you can call it a highlight of COVID was that COVID laid bare what the systemic and institutional problems were around race and health, right? It doesn't matter what people's stories are. There's no denying the data that has come out of the COVID experience, right? So if we can get, this is a, a, a big problem for us in the criminal justice system as well. Many things happen to black and brown women, the murders, the disappearances, the, the uh, prosecutors failing to bring rape cases, et cetera. But where's the data on that? No white researcher collects that data. The Justice Department doesn't collect that data. When they have the data, they don't disaggregate it. So we're always left to be talking about anecdotally what happens to black and brown women. We can't control that, right? That has to be like an institutional change that happens, that it's worth it to fund the research it's worth it to support the scholars of color who are doing the research because we need the data. The stories are there, but we need the data. And until that happens across the board in political science and sociology and law in medicine, we're left to wait for these uh, horrific moments like COVID where we're forced to acknowledge that, well, those stories before might've been anecdotal, but here's the data and the deaths to associate with the data to know that that story was real. So, you know, that, that's the problem with the, the, the competition between anecdotal information and hard, what they call so-called hard data. Yeah, I would, I would just, just piggyback off that. I, I wrote a piece um, last year, I'm still trying to get it published and, and tweak it a little bit, but you know, I, I've always struggled, frankly, with this, this idea of institutional racism. And I, I guess, you know, working in Native affairs, it, it, it kind of it, it came up and whacked me in the head after I wrote this book on Donald Trump. Um, and I say this is, is more of a conservative in terms of my economic views and, and so forth. Um, you know, the, the Treasury Department uh, delayed by three months, the PPE and other things to Native American nations. And, you know, I gathered those data uh, that, that Dr. Jacobs was talking about as best I could from the sources we had available. And the number of COVID cases in Indian country, you know, it wasn't linear, it was exponential. And the number of deaths that affected the elders, largely through asymptomatic exposure to, to their grandchildren, because these are places where people live in, in um, multi-generational homes. And, and for the life of me, I cannot understand why the Trump administration did not send out the money that Congress had approved in March of 2020. It, it took two federal court cases and, and the second circuit court in, in DC to finally compel the treasury department to send this out. Now, I don't know. Um, I, I talked yes, to you my do. Yeah, Yes, you <laughs> do. You know exactly why that money didn't come out because those people were not yeah. valuable, right? And this right. has yeah, 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 it's, 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 points about discussion, right? Yeah, it's the Honest same thing. discussion. Yeah, it was the same thing that happened this last week or last week on, on one of the shows on Fox. And I, I, my, I found my blood boiling 
you know, well, you know, it's just slush funds to tribal governments and, and you know, they waste the money and, and all this kind of thing. But, you know, these have real impacts. And, and I think, I think to, to, to Professor Jacob's point, you know, one of the things we're working on in terms of, of Native American studies, you might not think about Louisiana as the most progressive state in the country. I mean, you know, think about Hale Boggs and, you know, everybody else. But, you know, actually, we, we, we're trying to work on these issues. And I, I hope the same is true in the African American community that, you know, our federal system often prevents us from being able to collect the adequate information, whether it's, you know, African Americans, Native Americans, others, you know, because we've got local, state, you know, federal, and, and they don't communicate. And, and one of the things that the Louisiana governor did back in, in uh, June was to create a commission uh, to, to look at this very issue. Why can't we collect any data? Why do we have to go off anecdotal things um, why, you know, why can't we coordinate this better? And I hope it's a model, not, not just for indigenous peoples, but for all people so that we can actually have some accountability because that's what we deserve, you know, as citizens of this country, whatever our background or stripe. So, um, I don't so, so know. I'm going to jump on you one more time. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> it's not by accident, right? The government doesn't want transparency or accountability. As you know yourself from studying indigenous areas, the, the Bureau of uh, Indian Management mismanaged millions of dollars of money that belonged to the tribal nations, right? And hid it. I don't know how long that lawsuit, that lawsuit went on for 15, 20 years. When everyone in the government knew that that money had been mismanaged and the fact hidden, right? You have to believe that the persons who are being oppressed deserve transparency, deserve accountability, deserve to be treated like a human being, right? That's when honest conversation can be happening. But I'm not gonna sit down and debate with someone who doesn't believe I have a right to exist. That's not gonna happen, right? You go somewhere and have your epiphany and then come back and talk to me about transparency and accountability, but no. My relatives have been here since 1686, right? I can document that in the court records. I'm not having a discussion with anyone about whether I deserve to be here or deserve to be treated as a human being, right? So we've got to get well, to- I think, I, think that's, I think that's absolutely right. I think, you know, whatever small part, you know, as I as an individual, as a scholar can play to try to, to bring that that voice of those who have been disempowered, you know, to light. Um, I don't know. I small. I, I start from kind of a small level and try to to build up from there. But I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, and and I don't know how we overcome that. You know, I, I spent 350 pages trying to explain Donald Trump, and some of this had to do with native, some of it didn't. Some of it had to do with race. A lot of it didn't. Um, and, and I think you make some really good points. Um, how do we surmount that kind of obstacle? You're right. I mean, a lot of government agencies don't want um, transparency and they, they, they have, you know, obviously differing views about one's right to exist. Believe me, I could go on for three hours here, but I, I obviously won't. Um, but, but, but I appreciate what you're saying. Um, I just hope that those of us in the academy can can try to bring some, uh, you know, to to these things. Um, but but no, I appreciate right. the point. It happens one person at a time. That's just a slow process. So. <laughs> All right, uh, one more quick question, and then we're going to go to Q and A. With the, get your audience questions ready. Uh, what role does misinformation play in this controversy? Because I know it's out there. It's out there in in every form. I'm I'm an inf information guy. Yeah, I know it's there. Michelle? Well, you know, um, as I said before, misinformation has its place, its purpose, which is to obscure, right? This very same thing that uh, um, uh, Professor Conley is talking about. Um, there was an article that came out in the tech blogs this week, last week, about uh, the kid who um, was hired to create the misinformation accounts for Donald Trump, right? Young guy. And he's talking about how much he made, you know, why he did it, how much money it was, et cetera. 
<laughs> you know, um, and, and I, I want to say it's been about six weeks now. But if you follow the tech blogs, you can really learn a lot about misinformation because they were able to go back and track the COVID misinformation to 12 sources. Just think about how phenomenal that is. 12 people are responsible for this huge, massive network of false information about a public health epidemic. So that shows you the power of misinformation. And then don't get me started about Facebook and all that uh, because Facebook has been at the heart of two genocides, right? Uh, multiple civil wars across the country um, and all for money, right? And it's not like, I know people wanna say Zuckerberg doesn't know about it, but he does know about it. He's been advised since 2014 about the number of people who are being killed. I'm not talking about voting wrong. I'm talking about being killed throughout the world because of the misinformation that Facebook is posting and keeping on its website. So, you know, at some point as a society, we're gonna have to decide, you know, whether we're okay with people just dying so that others can make more money. Uh, and, you know, on some level, there's a lot of people who are okay with that. I hope you journalism people are not okay with that, <laughs> but that, that is a reality of our time. It has to do with um, the closing of local news. Um, there's been all kinds of wonderful studies about what happens to a community when their local news gets shut down. Uh, and the, because they're the ones who are the barrier between false information and really educating the community. And as you see all these little local presses shutting down and being gobbled up by conglomerates, we're getting more and more false information published and no way to attack it, right? right. And there's some wonderful studies out there. I hope you're uh, finding some of them for your students because it, it's just amazing how shutting down one local newspaper can have a massive impact on the voting ability of the citizens in that area. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it far too often. If you don't mind, right quick, Rich, same with music. I Heart, Clear Channel, buy up all the stations. I teach a hip-hop yes. class. So now you have commercial hip-hop. We're going to run the same song from Maine to Arizona 18 times a day. Yes. So as an artist, I want to be on the radio. Right. So again, that, you know, the, how all those monopolies and media information, major problem. So I teach my hip hop class about what is commercial hip hop versus hip hop. There is right. a difference. Right. You know, so they understand. And, and you know, there's a race aspect to that too, because yep. all that violent hip hop that's denigrating women, talking about drugs and all that, guess who listen, guess who the principal buyer of that right. music is? Young white males, yep. mm -hmm. 16 to 25. Yep. When you see hip hop, when you hear hip hop blazing out of a car in Gainesville, if you look over, it's a white kid playing that music, right? Mm -hmm. And the artists who are not putting out that kind of music can't get no. distribution, right? It's it's all it's all connected. It's all connected to our inability and unwillingness to deal with the deep dark mental illness in the United States, which is racism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good point there. I mean, I, I think several years ago, the Gainesville Sun was bought out by USA Today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, I don't know what the implications are for that, but but it seems like local stories take take somewhat of a back seat. I don't I don't know how many, if any, journalists we have. And frankly, I read the Alligator and so forth when I'm on campus. But you know, I think I think. Uh, Professor Jacobs raises a good question when it and and, and this goes to to uh, Dr. Foley's question you know misinformation um, I'll be I'll be frank with you I'm not on Twitter and I'm not on Facebook um, I just don't do these things because I'd probably be fired tomorrow if I actually express some of what I thought about you know but um you know, I, th I think that's part of it. And, and I'm not against social media, but, but you know, and, and, and Professor Jacobs probably knows a whole lot more than I do about the legal context of this, but we have things like Section 203 that protect, you know, protect Facebook and Twitter. And I don't want to go into all that. My point is that I, I think 
when I talk to my students, they get an awful lot of what they consider news and information from these, these social media sites. Right. Now, I've excluded myself from that. I mean, I, you know, I, I watch Fox News, I watch MSNBC, I, you know, I, I try to look at all these sides, figure out why these people are talking past each other. But I think increasingly, you know, that's the situation we're in, um, in, in terms of our political dialogue, that, that people are, are garnering their news from friends, you know, and it, it, it you know, Billy Bob, Ty, you know, Biden site, or, you know, yeah. uh, somebody, you know, who's anti-Trump, whatever it is. And, 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 you know, I think that's a real challenge for our democracy. I mean, we, we, we revere the First Amendment and free speech, um, but yet the social media sites are, are not wholly accountable. Some will try to censor things that those sites believe are, are, are false, and they may or may not be. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a quagmire as to how we, how we go forth with, you know, trying to put out you know, the facts and, and where people can actually glean those facts. Okay, but I think so, so now you got to meet the students where they are, right? Because yeah. all of the independent uh, investigative journalist organizations have Twitter feeds, right? I, I'm all over Twitter. I have like four or five fake accounts. <laughs> but um, each of them has a news feed from an independent journalist organization, right? And so I will tell my students, okay, you need to follow X or try to follow X to get the international news or follow this one to get that kind of news, right? And I try to steer them away from domestic press, frankly, because a lot of times the foreign press does a better job of reporting US news than the domestic press does because they're not interested in the yelling and screaming back and forth. So my students are all trained. Here's four foreign news sources, right? Jacob said, pick one. <laughs> you don't have to follow all of them. I follow all of them, but you don't have to follow all of them. Pick one. And if you speak a foreign language, try this one, right? Um, and it's my effort to help them uh, expand the sources of news. It's still a tweet, right? It's still a tweet. They can bookmark it and come back and read it later, but it's relevant to a full analysis of what goes on. Any journalist student who's not following ProPublica should be failed immediately, in my opinion, right? Now, that's, a, that's a great point. I think Mike will probably appreciate this. You know, I, I sometimes I go into my classes and um, you know, I, I've been blessed with language, not so much mathematics, but you know, I speak several languages. I go in and, you know, I, I bring up just the, the world press and my presidency or whatever course, you know, and we get the, the Irish Times from Dublin and the London Times and the Corriere della Sera from Ital you know, Italy and Le Monde from France and Die Zeit from Germany. My students have no idea what any of this means, so I try to translate it for them. And it's kind of interesting to look at how the foreign press looks, you know, even at these big national or international issues. Yeah. And I, I think, Doc, you know, Professor J Jacobs is right. You know, you get a very different view, and especially for some of us who, who've spent a lot of time abroad, how the United States is viewed from a different angle, uh, and, and you can bring that down to issues of, of, of race and ethnicity and, and these kinds of things. It's um, often a much more interesting read than you do from, well, certainly from Facebook and Twitter and, and, yes. and, and even in our national media, so it's a really good point. Okay, I see there's some good questions coming through. Yes. So give us some time. Thank you, panelists. You guys, you guys have educated me to no end. I really appreciate it. All right. So thank you, uh, uh, Professor Jacobs and Dr. Conley. I'm going to ask these questions. All right. First one I see here. My question: How to guide K through 12 teachers in leading discussions and classroom activities that focus on race issues amidst the political fight against CRT? Okay, so you can't miss the political fight. That's number one. Um, because the political fight, as I said, is not about CRT. It's about American history. So now that's real. And you people in Florida and Texas and all the other reactionary states, that's real. That's something that they have to think about. Now, what I often ask is, okay, if you're banning any discussion of race, 
what can I say about Thomas Jefferson? I love to pick on Thomas Jefferson because you know he's a he's a hero. Everyone loves Thomas Jefferson. My daughter went to UVA. She, you know, she, Mr. Jefferson's University. So I'm, I'm like on Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is a person who helped formulate our, our foundational documents, and yet he had enslaved people. He talked bad about black women. And he had a multi-year relationship with a black enslaved person who had multiple children by him whom he never freed, right? When I'm talking about Thomas Jefferson, I pull out notes on the state of Virginia. That's a document he wrote. It's published. All the white people talk about it, <laughs> right? It's full of racist crap, <laughs> right? If I'm studying Thomas Jefferson, I'm pulling out notes on the state of Virginia. And I'm going to assign my law students read notes on the state of Virginia and they come back to class and they're just like, oh my God, <laughs> who was Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> and I'm like, right, right. We have to find ways to teach American history with the text that we use. Just use the full real text. If you wanna talk about Texas and the formation of the state of Texas, Pull out a speech that President Polk wrote about, yeah, get them, go in there and uh, aggravate them and get them to defend themselves. And then we'll say we were attacked and we'll go in and we'll annex Texas. Nobody made that up. Polk said it. They debated it in Congress. Get the congressional record. Look at when Senator Calhoun said, we don't want Mexico if it's going to include Mexicans because they're brown. And that's going to disrupt the whiteness of the United States. No critical race theorist said that. Senator Calhoun said it. It's in the congressional record, right? That's how you get to it. You take the real American history resources, like the critical race theorists do, and you don't label it. Here's, here's the discussion of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago. Here's what Senator Calhoun said with all his racist stuff in there. That's American history. You know, you I, I, I would second that. I think, you know, I'm not a K through 12 teacher, but, but I, I do know that one of my biggest difficulties that I face, we don't have a, a Native American historian. We, we lost her about seven or eight years ago. And I, I think one of the biggest challenges that I face, which is in line with what, what Professor Jacobs is saying, I spend eight out of 16 weeks in my Native American politics course, just going back to history, to the founding, the establishment of the Bureau of Indian Affairs within the Department of War. Um, and that's the way many of my Native friends still see that agency. It's not, a, it's not an agency of the government, it's part of the War Department. Um, and, you know, taking them up through the history, none of them have any knowledge of the Indian Removal Act. Mm -hmm. Why do we have 4,400 Seminoles in South Florida and we've got 10,500 in Oklahoma? How did they get there? And let's not forget the Choctaw and the Chickasaw and, 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 and other tribes, the Navajo Long Walk. You go up to the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, the Treaty of of, of uh, Fort Laramie in 1868, uh, Wounded Knee in 1890. My students at the college level have no knowledge of any of this. Right. So uh, along the same lines, I think that Professor Jacobs is suggesting, let the documents speak for themselves. Go get the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Go get the, the, the appropriate documents. You know, as somebody I think in the chat just said, you know, in terms of African American history, let's look at that. Look at Dred Scott. You know, what what was it that motivated Roger Taney to to make that decision? You know, I, I, it was a 19th century mentality about property versus people. You know, teach these things because I think for those of us in the academy, at least from my experience. Um, you know, our, our students don't have much knowledge of our history. And, and if you believe who was a Churchill or whoever said, you know, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Well, I sure as heck don't want to repeat the mistakes of the, you know, 1800s and, and, you know, wait until, you know, 
Brown v. Board in, in, in 1954 to, you know, to solve some of these problems after what, 58 years after Plessy. And so, um, you know, I think that that's a, a real positive thing. And, and I, I recognize the K through 12 teachers don't have a whole lot of necessarily a whole lot of, of, of latitude yeah. over, over what gets taught because you're hamstrung by school boards and, and county state regulations. But, you know, I, I agree with Professor Jacobs, more and get that history out there, let it speak for itself. I know there's a Latin term and I'm sure she could help me with that. I got it. <laughs> um, but here's another example that you can, suppose you're teaching uh, high school European history. Right, and you you're allowed to cover World War II, right? Assuming you're in a school district where you're allowed to do that, get the documents where the Nazis discussed how Andrew Jackson's plan for extermination of the Indians was perfect, and they were going to base the final solution on Andrew Jackson, on the president of the United States, and the way he went after indigenous people in the United States. That's not made up. That's real. It's documented. It's in the records. You can find that. You can teach it as part of your European history coverage of the Holocaust. You see? So I'm not underestimating the danger that our K through 12 teachers are facing. They don't have tenure. You know, they're subject to the will of pot potentially ignorant uh, school board members. Um, and so you do have to be careful and you do have to consider your livelihood and your family's security. But there are ways to protect yourself by teaching American history with the documents and the evidence that is already in the congressional record. You know, all of our, our founding papers, all of the speeches of the presidents and the senators, that information is there and it's free. And, and just as a follow up to that, I would encourage you, you know, those of you in the audience, um, I, I'm not a historian, but I, I guess I've done a lot of somewhat quasi historical work over my career, reach out to us in the academy, you know, if we can provide those things, you know, some of you, you know, the congressional record is a pretty daunting thing to go and research. Yes. Yes. And probably like Professor Jacobs, I've done it in a, in a number of, of you know, uh, research projects, reach out to us. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to help you with the, these kinds of things, because, you know, again, history speaks for itself. So, you know, don't don't hesitate to to reach out to the UF community community if we can be of help. I have another question. How is the mythology of our history that defines us as a people reconciled with the actual historical record? Well, it's not, is it? <laughs> I mean, that that not to make light of the question, but uh, obviously the mythology is this melting pot, wonderful, great uh, nation. Um, and on any given day, you can look around and see that that is not true. Um, so I'm, I'm often fond of saying that the people who don't want to include the full history of the United States don't actually believe in the American dream, right? They may say they do, and they'll have patriot tattooed all over them and they'll fly the big flag. But part of the American dream is that everybody brings a piece and makes the whole better. So if you're intent on excluding everybody who's not looking like you, that means you don't believe in the American dream. You're afraid of it on some level, right? You're a traitor to your own ideology. So the thing I want people to think about, particularly those who are, are dealing with our young children, they're not fragile. Children are not fragile. They're intellectually curious. And just think how much more interesting history would be if we could talk about the whole history, everybody's history. Think how much more interesting that would be. In addition, it would teach our children that leaders are not infallible. They face difficult issues. Sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't. And the lesson that we can teach them is when you make a mistake, Stop, think about the solution. How can I correct this travesty I created instead of turning a blind eye to it and letting it go forward? Governing is hard. That's what they need to learn. Governing is hard. It's not just creating a slogan and repeating it 
500 times during your presidency. Governing is hard. It requires thinking. It requires coalition. It requires knowledge. It requires patience. It requires humility. If we taught our children that, they would be stronger Americans, right? They would be able to contribute a lot more than they're contributing now. But it's the parents who are afraid of that. And they're going to keep their kids ignorant so that they don't have an opportunity to grow at that level. And to me, that's the saddest part of the whole thing. Why would you want your child to stay as ignorant as you are? You know, I, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Jacobs makes a great point. I mean, um, we should have an inclusive kind of historical approach to teaching our children. Um, now, I happen to come from an Irish background. I teach a course on, on Irish uh, government and politics. And, you know, some of my students, and I have to say, you know, as one of my colleagues, it's kind of a heritage course that I teach on, on the Republic in the North. But you know, so most of my students have Irish surnames. And when I tell them, look at, look at New York and Boston after the famine, when, when our people came to New York and, and Boston, they, they, there were, in fact, there's a great song. I won't sing it for you because I have a terrible voice, but you know, there were signs in, 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 in the Northeast that said, no blacks, no dogs, no yeah. Irish. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were actually considered, you know, we were worse than dogs. No, no offense to my, my, you know, training Walker Coonhound over here sitting next to me, uh, but I mean, you know, and, and you you think about the Chinese and you think about Hispanics and and so forth. You know, again, I go back to that thing about you know to to form a more perfect union, and I think to to avoid the the, the racism, the all of these things in the past, we have to reconcile ourselves with it. This. As Professor Jacob said, it's part of our history. It's uncomfortable. I don't like to read it. I don't like to hear these stories that my my African American friends tell me. Or, you know, um, you know, my significant other is is, is from Honduras, and, and she came here, you know, twenty five years ago, and she tells me what she went through. Well, you know, you're from Honduras. Well, you're you know, you're a wetback. And it's like, no, no, I'm not from Mexico, but why would you call anybody from Mexico? That? And, and so you know, having those really, these are difficult conversations. And, and um, you know, one of the things that I, hopefully I've been blessed with and I probably haven't proved it tonight, but you know, when I go out to Native America, Indian country, or, or I talk to my friends, there, there's an art in listening. Um, you know, when we're not in this kind of, of, of context, just listening to the other person history, the things that have happened, the hurt, the good things, and, and that draws us closer together. And um, I think that that's critical. But our students need to get this, you know. But I like to add so a little complexity point about, like you said, Irish history. But we look at the Civil War, right? Irish, is, they were sergeants on both sides. So, you know, we got to dig because you hear that argument. Yeah, yeah. So we really want to get get you know because you get it well my irish came here they were broke it's all relative it's nuanced it's complicated so yes irish will call these names they got city jobs fire department and all that so we have to be history but, but that's a great point that is a great point on uh opening a door to having a discussion with a class on why white immigrants who came to the united states are not in the same situation as right. immigrants of color. And what happened to that immigrant community when they decided, oh, I'll lose my accent, I'll keep my mouth shut and people will just perceive me to be white, right? So they get the token, the token of privilege that comes with whiteness. So these are all wonderful teaching moments if people really want to use them. Many people don't know that the juvenile court system was created when the Irish and the Italians came to the United States because Protestants viewed them as deviants. Correct. They had big families, you know Catholics, right? They had big families. Because they had big families, the women worked in the public sphere, which, you know, to the progressive women who were Protestant, that was like, oh my God, these people are like devils, <laughs> right? Juvenile court was created to take those Irish and Italian kids away from their parents so that they wouldn't be infected 
with the deviance of having an Irish or a Catholic parent. You see, this is history. This happened in the United States, right? And it's not hidden in the sense that if you pick up a book or do some research, you can find it. Mm -hmm. Jews, the same thing. There's a wonderful essay called When the Jews Became White. It's by a woman named Karen Sachs, S-A-C-K-S, who is Jewish herself. And she's tracking out the history of the transformation of Jews from being people of color and not worthy into being white after World War II to satisfy guilt for not protecting them during the war. You know, so all of these things are out there and we can use them as wonderful teaching moments. And let me just throw this out there too before we end. There's a, a, a psychologist in the UK uh, who used to be an NBA basketball player. I'm gonna put his name in the chat. Oh, I know. Um... Um, he is fantastic. And he, um, has these little, uh, they call them bites. Yeah. And in three minutes, he can explain why you're privileged. When I first heard that, I was just like, no, that's not possible because it takes me two weeks. <laughs> Listen, three and a half minutes, he laid it out so clearly. You're just like, right, that's it. You know, and you can, you can find him uh, on Twitter. You can find BBC Bites, uh, posts him a lot, B-I-T-E-S. Um, but if you, if you Google his name, you'll see it. He, he talks about, um, privilege. He talks about what's the difference between being um, not racist and anti-racist, right? Which you might think those are the two of the same things, but it's not. Uh, he's just got some wonderful three to four minute bites on how to use these teaching moments that you're talking about to help create those opportunities for open discussion. And, and one more point in the thing, like how to explain. So explain this history, right? And we, you understand, if I go to Japan, right, do I want to be Japanese or Korean, right? Who has the power? So when you explain, I, okay, I'm Irish, only black people? Oh, no, I'm trying to get in the game. Yeah. That's Cuban survival, money. So now right. it's out of feelings, it's out of idealism, out of, no, you wouldn't. I get it. When I go to Japan, I'm hooking up with the Japanese because they run the show. Koreans are <laughs> struggling. I don't want any of that. And they're discriminated against. That's Japan. right. Who wants that? Right. So I'm going so with the power that? group. <laughs> also, if you if you learn uh, American immigration law, you it'll help you understand intra-racial yep. uh, problems, right? Because in, for, until 1957, in order to become naturalized here in the US, you had to be white. So there's all kinds of wonderful cases in the immigration case law where people who are stone cold black, <laughs> right? <laughs> Coming from another country, make an application to be naturalized and put check out white. Yeah. Right, and before the judges knew enough not to be ignorant on the bench, they would they would you could see in the discussion, the judges are like, now my eyes tell me you stone cold black, <laughs> but your lawyer is telling me there's some scientific theory about Mongolians that makes you white, and what am I supposed to do with that information? Am I supposed to trust my eyes that tell me you stone cold black, or am I supposed to trust some scientific theory I never heard of that tells me you're white? Right, and this is this is why communities of color who fight with each other because not because they hate you but because they were trying to get access to resources to whiteness to having a house to being able to send your children to a good school and if being white was what was required that's what they were going to do you see it's so complicated it's so complicated and i'll say this too about the tension and being uncomfortable uh a lot of people now are misquoting martin luther king Oh. <laughs> in ways that are, are mind boggling. And I do follow Bernice King and she's constantly saying, don't use my father for this crazy thing that you're saying. But if everyone would just read letter from a Birmingham jail, right? It's short. Mm -hmm. He talks about tension in that piece. Mm -hmm. The problems we're facing are complex and they require discomfort in order to look at them and examine them. It took us a long time to get into this hole that we're in now. We can't wipe it away with a black president. We can't wipe it away with a president who's almost a hundred, <laughs> who knows how to say the right things, but doesn't necessarily do the right things, right? We can't wipe it away from that. There's gonna be some terribly uncomfortable discussions and they're not personal. It's not about you, Richard Conley, or you, Mike Foley, or you, David Canton. They're about the condition of living 
in the United States of America. It's not personal. It's political. It's historical, right? It's economic. And that's what we need to deal with, those uncomfortable moments in order to break forward. I don't know that we'll ever be able to do that in the United States. I know people hope that we can, but this is my third go round <laughs> on this thing. I was born the year Brown versus Board of Ed was decided. When I was in the eighth grade, schools got desegregated. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I don't have high hopes, but I'm hoping that when my grandchild's grandchildren are born, we will have moved forward from the 1930s that everyone is trying to keep us in now today. That's a good note. I think uh, we've come to the end, I'm sorry to say, but uh, this has been a fascinating, fascinating. You guys are really smart. You know, I'm just a yeah, journalist. Well, that's why they hired us, presumably. You guys are really smart. Even though after they get you, they try to pretend you're not. <laughs> you know that in I, I'd, say, I'd, say, I'd say Professor Jacobs is the smart one here. I, I've, learned, I've learned a lot from, from your your interventions here this evening. And, Don't undercut you know, what you I, know. I Don't undercut you. what you know. All right, so, well, um, David, panelists, if your audience um, wants to submit questions in writing, yes. I'm happy to answer questions in writing. Excellent. Great. Thank great, you, Michelle. Great, great. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Richard. It's been a, a wonderfully enlightening for me. Great. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've learned a lot, and this has really been good. So. Thank you very much, and, Michelle, and you thank you for you. our audience. You thank you, David, for putting this together. Great. Have a good evening. You All too. Right. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having us so much. This has been great. Thank you.